I've never spoke in front of a grace audience ever. Or, and even the ones I have, they didn't really understand the dispensational message and specifically Jesus Christ preached according to the revelation of the mystery. Are you, are you guys grace believers? Yeah. Praise God. Um, so they kind of look at you funny, you know, when you talk about there's no required baptism, it's no works required, it's by faith alone, we don't pay tithes. I mean, even bringing these things up are 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy 2, uh, women learn in silence, the men are the leadership, that you get attacked, you, I mean, silenced, and um, it, it's, uh, what I'm going to do today, I'm going to endeavor to do is, uh, I want to share my testimony, not my whole life or nothing, but just a little piece of who, what made me the man of God I am today, and uh, the process of religion, getting to where I am now, through the denominational mainstream of Christendom, it was quite a path. It was, you have to really want the truth. You, I mean, and God will give it to you. Or you could be complacent and just be spoon-fed all day and be led astray in error. And that's what I was seeing after I started understanding. Uh, I'll, I'll, we'll start, we'll, let's get started. Um, Okay, I can't see it, so there it goes. Did it spook yourself? <laughs> okay. If you need well, any verses or anything, hit me up. I, I know, I got, got that. That's, that's right, <laughs> and probably will. Okay, I'm Brother Toby from Stockton, California. Uh, Michelle, you watching? I hope it's coming in. Let's say it the scripture. I'm standing in for my, my pastor today, which is a privilege and an honor. And it's quite intimidating, to say the least, you know. Um, so I, I had, I, I'm teaching out of the book of Romans, and, and if you're following me on what said the scripture. But today I'm going to take the opportunity, because we're intimate, that you could know me a little bit. And anyone watching can understand that you're not alone in your struggle against the truth. I've come to understand that Christendom in general, the churches in general, are the opposition to the truth. They're our biggest enemy. And so I want to share some of that, how I got to where I'm at today because of my perseverance and my my desire to know the truth personally and how it came to be, how, how I discovered right division. It's, it's really not out there. It's, uh, I'll, I'll explain how I, I discovered it and how God had a part in every step of the way. In retro, retrospect, you can actually, I could see it, you know. Um, so it's, it, my message, I just want to bring hope and encourage people that you're not alone if you feel all alone and if you feel rejected and silenced, that's par for the course. That's the way it is. And uh, so I just thank God there was an assembly this close to my house, which is an hour away. And uh, thank God I found it. So let me pray, and then um, I'll get started. I want to let me thank Pastor Ron personally. Uh, Pastor, thank you. God makes ministers. I, I, I really appreciate that you would believe in me. Like you, it to actually, it, it, nobody gets a pulpit. I mean, really, it's like it's intimidating. But uh, thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Jesus. Help me, Lord. Uh, okay. Uh, 
All right, Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, have your way. Bless our pastor, his little girl. <clears throat> have your way with this message. Uh, help me to encourage and strengthen, stretch the faith of the people. Work through me. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, I'll start out here, um, Romans 5 and 1, because this is actually where I'm, I've got to in the book of Romans as I teach it. So I'll, I'll start here. It's wonderful. One of my favorite verses, to be honest. Romans 5, verse 1. Well, let me start at 24 for content. Romans 4.24, start right there. But for us also, the imputed righteousness of God is what we're talking about here. But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for, for our offenses, and was raised again for our justification. Therefore, Romans 5, verse 1, because of the atonement made right here, because of the redemption that was given through Christ in his blood, therefore, being justified by faith, and faith alone, I might add, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. That's positional. And rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Amen. Now, this piece he talks about, uh, there's a song I was listening to on the way over here. It goes something, I'm not going to sing it, but it goes something like, uh, I thank God yesterday's gone. I'm well acquainted with shackles and chains and I'm washed in the blood. Thank God. Thank Jesus. And that's kind of like my story. Um, I just thank God yesterday's gone. You know, and I had to learn to walk by faith and faith alone. Taking God at his word. Just simply believing God. You know, some people say, I, I believe in God. I said, well, that's not saying much of a statement. I said, do, do you believe God? That's, that's a man of faith. Do you take him at his word, literally believe God, what he says? And that kind of be, it sets them to make them think now, do I believe God at his word? Take him at his word. Because the demons believe in God. But do you believe God? That's faith. And that's what God is looking for. Uh, there's a principle you can't go around in, in uh, Hebrews. You, you have to believe that God is before you could even approach him. You have to believe that he exists. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Virtually impossible. Although he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And that's how I got where I'm at today. I diligently sought after the truth. Diligently. Now, like I was saying, I'm not, you know, I'm familiar with shackles and chains in life. And um, I'm the baby, I'm the, I'm the baby of seven children. I was born in New, Albuquerque, New Mexico, 1960. My father and my mother both spoke Spanish as they're, they're born in America, but their first language is Spanish. My father was discriminated, discriminated against from his story to me. And he joined World War II. He joined the Army to prove his citizenship. He's a World War II veteran. Served in the Southern uh, Theater, South Pacific, 
25th Division, Tropical Lightning uh, Infantry in the Army. And uh, he survived. And being that he was uh, surviving out of World War II, he wanted to instill patriotism in his children. So he kind of, he raised us all American and basically took our Mexican culture and put that to the side in my family. Some people go, you speak Spanish? And I've learned some along the way, but I wasn't raised in it. And you know, it's like, well, no, I'm an American. I speak English like you, you know, and, and they can't perceive it. So I had that dilemma growing up. They call it, they, some are so ignorant, they say, you speak Mexican? I said, well, that's not a language, but you have to correct people along the way, right? And, but my mother would play Mexican music on Sunday, and they'd go to the Concilio, which is a Mexican organization, and we would hear them speaking Spanish, right? And my relatives are Spanish, right? But we didn't speak it. So that's just the dilemma I had to go through as a child, being called a Mexican that couldn't speak Spanish. So there was a lot of racism back then, or prejudice. Anyway, and that's why I don't speak it today. That's a, another story. But my father was patriotic. My mother was a loving mother. Uh, I have three older brothers, three older sisters, and we were raised old school, disciplined, have respect for your elders, uh, with responsibility, go to school, clean your room, throw the trash. We had chores, go play on Saturday, go outside and play, come in before dark. Respect your elders was a big one that was instilled into us back in the day. And we got whippings, I mean, really with the belt back in the day. And uh, me being the baby, I would see my older siblings getting whipped for things. So there's an old saying that says, uh, a wise a smart man learns from his own mistakes, but a wise man learns from the mistake of others. And I, I believe I was learning as I was a child the things I shouldn't be doing because of their punishment. So I was learning by observing. Children learn what they observe. And uh, we went to church every Sunday, every Sunday. My el my el we were Mormons, by the way. I was raised a Mormon. Been there from Utah, it's kind of. That's where the Mormon temple's at. I've been there. Uh, I was a deacon in the Mormon church. My oldest brother it was a missionary for the Mormon church. He's an elder of that church today. And uh, so I was raised a Mormon. And I, we went to church every Sunday. It's instilled to me to dress Sunday best on Sunday. That's how we had to dress. I couldn't even kick rocks in my little shoes because my mom would spank me because those are my Sunday <laughs> shoes. You know, kids just kick. And, uh, and we were poor when I was little, so we only had that dress for Sunday, but I remember a little tired. I didn't like it. Still kind of don't. And uh, that's how we did it. Take it off when you got home, and every Sunday you went to church. You went to school. We, it, we, I was pretty programmed, pretty disciplined very respectful young man. Um, and then the 70s rolled around, the late 60s. My older brother in 68 went to a mission for the Mormon church. He left the home. My next two elder brothers left the home to go to Vietnam. So my three older brothers were gone. Two of my older sisters, one married off, one got pregnant, so she had to get married off. They left the home. And this was in Denver, Colorado, by the way, where I was brought up from 2 to 12. At 12 years old, just me and my sister, kind of like I call her my little sister, but she's a year and a half older than me. We were left, and my father all of a sudden said, we're going to California. Now, I see this as an opportunity where Satan took a full advantage of my vulnerability. I was 12 years old. I was, I was raised in a family structure. And out of nowhere, they were gone. And then we moved from 
an environment where I was settled, had ambitions, I had dreams, I had my friends I was raised with. We were going to go to the same junior high my brothers did. In my mind, I'm going to wrestle, I'm going to play baseball, I'm play football, be just like they did. And see, my father was in their life, in my elder brother's life. I'm the baby. My brothers went from 1950, okay, that's my eldest, 50, what's after, what's below 50? Uh, 69, yeah, right, 69. They were three years apart, one, one right after another. Mike, Tim, Prado, okay, 50, 69, wait, about 49? 40, is, no, no, I'm trying to, I, I, I'm, I, I'm bad with math. What's, what's under 1950? 53. Right after that, 51. I'm going yeah, backwards, see what I'm doing? Okay, 50, 51, 52. Yes. So they were, raised, they were like that, and my father was in their life. Trained them to fight in the gym at Pal, so boxing. Three, three sons in a row. Right in a row. Gotcha. Then three sisters in a row. 51, 52, 53, four, five, six. Two years went by, Patsy, and then a year and a half, me. My baby. I was actually not planned. Um, we, and I have a, the weirdest name, Tobias. I, my oldest brother named me out of a book, Toby Tyler. But anyway, so they, my point is, they were raised with more structure than me. When I was 12 years old, we moved to Vallejo, California, which to me was culture shock. Totally liberal, more gangster, more player. I wasn't exposed to this kind of lifestyle and violence and uh, liberalism, it, it just totally, I didn't know how to act. I was, I was more of a square, more of a mama's boy, uh, real respectful and shy and quiet. <laughs> I had a, still had a little kid haircut, you know what I mean? And we moved, and uh, so I'm 12 years old. I'm going into junior high. I don't know anybody. And the environment is totally different. Um, that was that was quite a, a shock in my life. Satan took total advantage of that. And unbeknownst to me, my mother and my father at that time, because they split up when I was 15, but through them three years in California, they were separating. And you could see it in the family. Because I remember Christmases where it was no more Christmas music. No more joy, no more family reunion, no more. And I used to crave that. And I was like, I didn't know what was going on there, you know. Um, till finally in 70, 75, I was 15. My mother thought, well, he's, he's the baby. He's old enough now. I'm leaving this. And I'm going to say what she called it. I'm leaving this man, right? He was a womanizer. And uh, been one all his life, but. He did instill work ethic in his boys. I work hard to this day, you know, but, um, and, all the, and other things, taught us things. But he was a womanizer, and she left him when I was 15. Therefore, that exposed me to the vulnerability of, like, of the streets. So I didn't have a father figure. My brothers were gone. And by then, 12 to to 15, I played sports, got to know a lot of people, but at the same time, I was gravitating toward bad company. So I wanted to be cool, you know what I mean? And uh, when they split up, they lost the house, and I moved in with my dad, and it was just me and him. And my sister got pregnant, so she left. So it was just me and my father, and he didn't have time for me, really. I remember once I got arrested in the street, and instead of going to the juvenile hall, my, the officer brought me home so he could meet my parents. And I never could find him. He picked me up off the street ma many amount of times. Officer Rogers, I'll never forget his name. And I'm like, you got to stop doing this, dude. This look, this look bad on me. Because he'd just pull up at night, pull me off the street, out of the crowd, get in the car. You know, it didn't look good in my eyes, but he wanted to meet my father. He'd take me home. He cared about me. He really cared. 
and uh, never found my father. But anyway, he tried, and, and he, he actually made an impact on me. But um, I quit going to church when I was about 15. I was, like I said, I was raised a Mormon. I was a deacon in the church. I went to the Mormon temple in Oakland and baptized, I was a proxy for 40 spirits. I'm baptized. Right, because they do the baptism for the dead? Mm-hmm. Right, right. So I proxy, I, and by faith, I didn't understand it. I just did it by faith. I was just, and it was an honor, a privilege. Nobody, not everybody gets to go in that section of the temples of the Mormon church either. You got to be ordained and you, you, not everybody, your guests can't just do that. So, so I was, uh, my mother has always led us on, she, she put the seed in me as a child and to the day she died, she stood on a promise she used to say the Lord gave her. Raise your children in the way of the Lord and when he gets old, he won't soon depart. I'm paraphrasing, it goes like something like and she would always quote that. And we put her through, excuse my language, but hell, all of us. And I'm the baby. I was with her to the very end. She, she ended up dying of, uh, I was closer to my mother than my father. She ended up dying of brain cancer. And um, when you get old and, and you can't remember things no more, Alzheimer's that hit her at she had cancer, but it came back and it got in the brain. She had survived the breast thing, but um, so it was hard to see her leave. Uh, it really was because I was ministering to her and her seniors at their senior home for five years before she passed. So she understood. She got saved by faith alone. She followed me out of the Mormon doctrine and understood the Pauline epistle. Really. And uh, that was a blessing. And in the beginning of my walk with God, in 1999, I came to the end of myself. By then, I had picked up a progressively fatal disease, alcoholism, and that's what they call it, a progressively fatal disease. And I've been, I've been in and out of jail for at least five years on the installment plan. And uh, very close to going to prison a couple of times. By the grace of God, I didn't go. I've had my license revoked, revoked, not suspended, revoked from the state of California. The judge said, I don't want to see on the state streets or highways of California for 10 years, or you're going to prison. You're in violation. And I heeded that warning. I didn't drive ever again for 10 years. Except once, my sister talked me into going somewhere to do something for her, and I got pulled over. <laughs> and by the grace of God, he just took the car and let me walk. I was like, I couldn't explain it. That, thank you. I was dirty as can be, too. And uh, by the grace of God. And another time, the judge, uh, I appeared on a fourth DUI. And he just shook his head and said, Mr. Pacheco, uh, I should be sending you to prison, but you lucked out. One dropped off, a seven year went by on one of them. And it, last week, he said, you'd be going to prison. Because that's when they had mad mothers against drunk driving mm -hmm. in the courtroom. And they were making sure we were getting arrested and punished. You know what I mean? And I deserved it. I'm not saying I didn't. Um, but I'm just sharing that because God has diverted me from you know, harsher incarcerations in the county jail. Even I could have went to a uh, youth authority. That's youth prison when I was 17. But my brother showed up in court and took me, took my, took me to Stockton. That's how I ended up there from Vallejo. And it took custody of me from my father. I didn't know that was happening. I was excited to go to prison. I, it was like part of your resume. That's what you was going to do, you know. But um, God has, it seems like God has always diverted me from the lifestyle that the Satan was trying to bury me in, basically. But anyway, uh, in 1999, I came to my end.
came to my end, I was, I was bankrupt. Physically, spiritually, emotionally, financially for sure. And uh, I cried out to God under the bridge in Stockton, California, homeless, hungry, tired, rejected. My mother would let me sleep on the on outside of her house, but not inside of the house. She'd feed me, but you sleep outside, like a dog. <laughs> and she actually claimed me for 10 years for uh, taxes. I didn't know that. <laughs> she not in work. Every once a year, she'd give me a big lump, though, like 50 bucks or so. When I got sober, she was like, don't you remember I'd give you that money? I'd be like, huh? She goes, I was claiming you hmm. as, I don't know. A, 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 kind of dependent? Yeah. Really? Yeah, as a dependent. She know, I wasn't working, and I was out in the street. And um, that's, that's just, you know, how bad I got. In and out of job, been in and out of institutions, you know, recovery houses, live-in programs, ADAP, that's where you get arrested, dead incarceration, you go to a program. Um, detox, that's straight insanity. You're just drunk and they put you there and you're amongst drunks, just insane. Uh, drunk tanks, paddy wagons, I mean, you name it. I, I, it took me through the ringer. Uh, they say when you get in the grip of alcoholism, no human power can set you free. None. You're beyond help. You need divine intervention. And so that's what led me to God, uh, back to God. I, like I said, my mother planted a seed and stood on a promise. And I called out to God with the faith but doubt. If, if you're there like that, if you're there, help me. You know, and my life changed from that moment I totally surrendered to God, really. I was... I had no more reservations to drink or use drugs ever again. And because I, I was, I didn't know that, but I was done. And I, I didn't know at that moment, but God did. God knew I was done. And uh, so by ordering my steps, circumstances, places, people, places, things, and stuff like that, I ended up in Alcoholics Anonymous again, where he kept putting me over and over and over. And, uh, this time I listened, you know, I listened. And I, now that I, I, I study scripture and I see the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, I see the parallel. I see where he took them out of the Bible and it applies them in a practical way for even a heathen atheist could come to God. That's the purpose. And uh, so I went there and the first step surrender, and I did under that bridge and uh, I knew I had something had changed in me because I got a job and I made a false resume because I hadn't worked in a heck of a long and they fell for it and they said come in Monday I was like wow I couldn't believe it. and my mom bought me a tool I, I do body and fender she bought me a tool and Friday she gave me money that was a mistake Friday Saturday Sunday i went on a binge right so Monday I'm like I gotta go to work I hadn't worked in 10 years right only reason I showed up is because she gave me that tool that's the only reason man I, I was two hours late and drunk and they go go to work that that was the grace of God they put me to work I could barely see almost double it's like 10 in the morning I was two hours late and I worked and uh I don't know, a month went by and the guy was taking me home and stopped at the liquor store and I had been going to meetings and he bought me a beer and I said no. And I was like, where did that come from? I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know I had that power. But see, I didn't know God was working in me at that time either. I just knew I was following directions like he wanted me to do. And uh the second step is came to believe in a power greater than ourselves will restore us to sanity. And like I said, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So it was like, okay, I, I'm going to believe in this power. And the third step is uh, 
It's the God of your own understanding, is how they put it. To turn your will and your life over to, to the care of God as you understand him. So, so with your sick mind, you can make your own God up if you want to. And some people do. And today I go to AA not just to help encourage people to stay sober, but to give them salvation as well. I, I preach Jesus in there. And he, he's not well accepted all the time, I'll be honest. But uh, he stirs it up. But I do it anyway because that's the God of my understanding today, Jesus. So I have two ministries, AA and Scripture. It's two. So uh, God keeps me real busy like that. And uh, I took that third step serious, the God of my understanding. I remember the first time I... A sponsor, older man, a gentleman. He's a they're, they're sponsors, they're uh, you know coaches. They got a working knowledge of the steps. They've been around with good sobriety for quite a while. You pick one, and uh, he asked me that question. He says, "Well, who do you think God is?" And I was like, I didn't really know because I kind of read the Bible. I was a Mormon. I went to Catholic things, even in jails and stuff like that. I really didn't know. But I did say this. I said, well, I think he's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what I said. And he was like, yeah, you got it. He was a believer, right? I didn't really know what, it, what all that meant, that Trinity meant, that God had. You know, I didn't. But it was in me, so it come out, right? Anyway, so I start seeking this, this God, and it was the journey. That was, that's where the journey really began into to my understanding of who and what Christ did, how now he's after the cross and not before. And I didn't know that. Um, when I first started getting into Scripture and, and having issues, people would say, pray on it, go to Isaiah 53, suffer with the Lord. Okay? Claim that promise that we're healed by his stripes. Okay. I go to John. With it, with, go to the elders with oil and pray over the sick. And Okay. I was doing these things. I didn't have a little bottle of oil I carried around with me. Play, my, the first one was the mother of my children. She died of cancer eventually. I tried to heal her. I used to go to her with all the time. Pray over her all the time. And she didn't get better. She died. I went to another gentleman I knew was he was dying of a coma in the hospital. Got the scriptures, read them. They thought I seen them looking at me like I'm crazy. I'm speaking the word over this man, but I didn't know that I was in the wrong promises. I didn't know. No one taught me that, and it wasn't working. I had to be honest with myself. I'm like, these people ain't getting healed, man. I'm trying. I'm believing, right? You say right here, God, you know, like that. And I'm like, what's up with that? I don't know, right? And so I'm, I'm in, my first ministry was to stand and be a, just say the word before the, the offering. And they showed me Malachi, chapter 3. Well, the man robbed God, right? Mm -hmm. Robbing with your offerings and your tithes, right? And I, So I don't know, I'm preaching it. Right? And they gave me to start the tithe. And I don't know better. I'm doing what I'm told to do by faith. They said, if you don't tithe, you and all your faith already. You already acknowledge your faith. One day I said, how come God requires money to, be, to please him? I, I don't get that. And they were like, that's a good question. And one of them girl goes, it helped. Because they couldn't answer it. <laughs> and I see, when I was a Mormon, I'm going to tell you something. I, we used to collect tithing from the door. We'd go to your house with a little envelope tithing. They'd be hiding, you know, they hide. You could hear them in the house. But we'd go get it. <laughs> and even as a child, I felt wrong to do that. I really did. I didn't think it was right. They were hiding and, you know, conniving. 
here I am knocking on, I'm, you stay there till they open that door, you know, like gangsters. <laughs> and it was like, I, something in me as a child knew that wasn't right then. And as I'm walking and learning who God is now, it, I, it didn't sit right with me. Just didn't. But I didn't rightly divide, so I went along with the program, right? So I went along for quite a while, since 99. Went to, I don't know, four or five different ministries. I, I didn't know they were all charismatic today. I, one guy was apostolic. Uh, he was a drunk like me, but he was sober. He said, you need Jesus. You just, meetings ain't enough for you. It's like, all right. So first thing they, they stand on is Acts 2.38. That's how you get saved in that church. Mm -hmm. Repent, be baptized, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And if all three of those ha don't happen, you're not saved, period. Pentecostalism stuff, right? Yeah, and then all the <coughs> crazy, entertaining stuff they do in there. And, uh... My first time I was going to go get baptized, I wanted to see one first. One guy came out of the water sad, and I was wondering what happened. So I got, went to ear rob over there like that, and uh, he said, I didn't get it. He didn't, get this, he didn't come up speaking in tongues is what, that, what, what happened. Mm -hmm. And I was in my mind like, why would he be? Something wasn't clicking with me. This ain't right. Why would God require all these things, right? I'm like... I don't know about all this, you know what I mean? And so I was like almost ready to shipwreck my faith in the Bible. It was crazy, but I wouldn't give up. And uh, I was unemployed one day. I was under one pastor, and I left that ministry. The women were running it. No offense, but they, they were running it. <laughs> and you, you, know, you couldn't do anything without them. They told me to say the opening prayer one day, and the president had got elected, and I said, let's pray for our leadership to go to Timothy. And they go, no, that's political. You can't pray, none of politics around here. And I was like, it says right here in Scripture to pray for our leaders and kings that we might live. No, you know, and I'm like, so I didn't, right? See, so it's things like that that you start, you know, questioning and so and I stayed there for a while and uh then I went to another one and he had this weird kingdom message that there's no rapture we're kings and priests he's getting it from prophecy and we're gonna set the world right so Christ comes we'll prepare it for him that's out there right now kingdom now sir. kingdom now I could never find it in scripture. I questioned him one day about the rapture, and he said it was a myth. And that's what he literally threw me out. He threw me out. Yeah, he threw me out, too, because I, I tried to convince him in scripture, and he didn't want to hear. He closed his mind and threw me out, told me to go find a place. I was with five years with this man. Go find a place where they believe like you. Now, mind you, within this five years, I ran across this little old man named Les Feldick. I was unemployed. I got laid off one year, and I got unemployment. And I earned it, which I hadn't worked for a long time. But, and it was about good to get paid and stay home for a minute. And uh, I put the TV on one day, and Les Feldick, I don't know if you guys heard of him. Sure. Yeah. He was on. So I started taking notes with this guy. That was the beginning. I'm going to show you the verse that uh, transformed my thinking. I was listening to this man because I didn't work. God's intervention. I was getting paid so I could sit and not look for work. And uh, start taking notes and being a Berean, going over the, what, I was, what he was teaching, right? And he said, uh, this one right here, it got me. Galatians 1, first of all, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. He expounded on that. This was by revelation. No men taught this man. Nobody, he didn't go to a seminar. He didn't go to college. You know, he's expounding. I'm like, hmm. 
Yeah, and then 11 says, I guarantee, I certify you, brethren, the gospel which I preached is not of me, it's not after man. Now, you have to take that for value of what he's saying here. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. I was like, wow. The only thing I've heard in church about revelation is God gives you this revelation that's not in the Bible, but it's your interpretation of something that you think he gave you. I used to be questioned like that. Did you get a revelation, brother? Did you get a revelation? I'm like, and it makes you feel like you almost want to make one up. It's religion. It's religion. Did you get tongues, brother? Did you get tongues? I wrote some down, and I could have mocked one. I could, I could do it now. I could have made one up just to fit in, because almost the, the pressure was mm -hmm. on me to do that. Probably tons of people that do do that, huh? Yeah, all of them, <laughs> except me. Sure. One guy even goes, here's how you do it. They're like baby, like a baby go, ba 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 ba. Start right there, ba ba. <laughs> what? And, and I'm not joking, man. One guy says, "Say hallelujah real fast." Keep saying it, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I'm like, this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not even joking, man. And so I'm going through all this, right? And I run across this guy right here, Les Faldick, and then he gives me this verse. Boy, this one blew me away. Galatians 1, chapter 2. Galatians 2. I'm sorry, Galatians 2, chapter 7 and 9. Verse 7 and 9. Is that what it is? Galatians 2, verse 7 and 9? Yeah. But contrary wise, when we saw the gospel of the uncircumcision? Yes. Yeah, did I write it down right? Yeah. Galatians. Two. Verse seven, right? Oh, oh Ryan. Seven through nine. Is it fourteen? It's seven through nine. It's seven it, through nine, huh? The, but, but contrary. Okay. Because I have my, gospel. I had another Bible. I didn't highlight it in this one. Yes. Here it is, though. It, it, this is this is what got me. But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel, yeah, that's it. But contrary, where are we at? Seven. But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of, right there, of. Now, you get any other translation, you're going to miss that. Mm -hmm. I had other translations, but I was going along with the King James with Les Felder. And he made that perfectly clear. He said, but contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of, the uncircumcision, that's the Gentile, was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. That verse right there, it was like God put on, I put on new glasses. And things started to focus in. I, I went, that's two different gospels. That's two different. This was the beginning of the right division for me. I went, wow. And he's talking about, I can't preach in a church because they won't let me because they won't, they won't, they won't hear it. And I'm like, I'm thinking they'll hear me, right? Because I'm new. They won't hear you. I, I know what he's talking about now. And so that verse right there got me. And then Acts, another one, I'm giving you the verses that, that started to shape my mind into the Pauline dispensational right division. If you go to Acts 19, I hope I wrote them right correctly. The Spirit was using the word to teach you. All right. Go to Acts 19 and 1. Is that the one? It says, uh, 19 and 1, And it came to pass, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper. No, I don't know why I wrote that. Which one are you looking for? Um, 
Acts 2, go to Acts 2. I'm sorry. Peter, go to Peter. Here's where you get that Acts 2.38 also. And, and there's a distinction between their salvation and our salvation. Yeah. In Acts 2.38, I'll, I'll start right there just because I mentioned it. This is the Jews, bat, the, the, the Jews process of salvation. <clears throat> no one ever, I, I'm telling you, I went to a church, this is what they taught me. For the little flock, right? The, the, I, I had no. I didn't know what a little flock was. Right. Acts two thirty eight. I started seeing these. Peter said unto them, "Repent and be baptized." And they do that at church. Repent all morning, every day. Come to the altar every day. And performance. Every day, every every how every head bowed, every eye closed. Raise your hand. And I mean, it's a staged. It's practically state. Want to go up to get everyone else to go. Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission. There's a difference. You won't find that in another translation. For the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Ours is, your, by grace are you saved. Ephesians 2.8, through faith. Not of works. It's not of yourselves, lest any man should boast. So I'm like, wait a minute, there's there's a con there's contradictions. What's going on, right? So I write Les Feldick, right? Oh, and another one I, I learned in Luke 18. This one This one blows people away today when I show them this one in a denomination. Luke 18, 31 through 34. People think that Christ preached the death, burial, and resurrection. No, he didn't. He preached the kingdom gospel as we know today. Right. It's like John the Baptist and Christ and Peter and the twelve. I know that. We know that today. A but look at what this one blew me away. Acts, uh, okay, let me find it. 19, 31. 18, I'm sorry, Luke 18, 31. Luke 18, 31. Right. Sorry about that. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on, and they shall scourge him and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. Now we know that as the gospel. But listen to the next verse. And they understood none of these things. This saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. I went, God hid that from them. That's the mystery. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What Paul laid that foundation. See, I'm telling you, God, I, I started seeing things clearly. Little by little by little. So what do I do? I order a book. <laughs> I, I order a book. And the back of it goes, and I started out by faith, we are justified. Therefore, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 5.1. Justification is a Bible word that means the act of pronouncing righteous, to set you forth as righteous. And you also, God looks at us like we've never sinned, ever. That's mind-blower for some of them. And to be cleared of guilt, we have peace with God. Thank God yesterday's gone. I'm familiar with shackles and chains, but today I'm free by the grace of God. I know that today. And, and this is Martin Luther's dilemma. He said, many believers have been troubled when comparing what Paul says about justification to what James says. Paul says in Romans 3.28, Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith 
without the deeds of the law. James says in 2.24, Ye see that then that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. That's a dilemma. Things that are different can't be the same. All right. I think that's written there somewhere. Martin Luther wrote this following paragraph over 500 years ago about the, his challenge with these two statements of the Word of God. He never figured it out. Many sweat to reconcile Paul and James. They still can't. <laughs> but in vain. Faith justifies and faith does not justify. You know, I asked my father one day when I was a child, do you believe the Bible? He said, the Bible contradicts itself. When I, I was real little, sitting on the armrest of the old Oldsmobile, we sit in the middle with no seat belts and all that. And I remembered that the rest of my life, even now. It says, and Martin says, if anyone can harmonize them, I'll give him my doctor's hood and let him call me a fool. That's what Martin Luther wrote. And he was on track in his approaching to resolve this apparent contradiction when he wrote, we must look and see to whom it has spoken, whether it fits us. And that's that saying, all scripture is for you, for your learning, Romans 15, 4, mm -hmm. written for our learning, but all, it, all scripture is for you and to you, but all scripture is not. All is for you, but not all to you. Directly. But all, not all to you. Right. It's all for our learning, mm -hmm. but it's not all for our doing. There it goes. Can't read somebody else's mail and think it's addressed to you, right? Exactly. Exactly. And I'm going to share just a little bit of the, I'm going to read the whole book, but this is what I went, wow. I was at dog park. Me and my wife had a little dog, and he's running around. I'm reading this, and I'm just going, why didn't anybody know this? <laughs> Ministry I just left at the January of that year, he told me, the verse of the year is study to show thyself to prove unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That was the verse of the year, he said, on January at midnight, right? I was like, whoa, because I had been hearing less, right? right? I'm like, does he even know what that means? He didn't know. And I didn't have the, I hadn't went up yet. And... Paul writes in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now knowing now what I know, this points to the judgment seat of Christ in our reward, or loss, in our honor, or disgrace. I didn't know none of that. So he tells us what to study, why to do it? To be approved to God and how to do it. Rightly divide. I went, whoa. And this book explained it. Rightly dividing means to cut right now. Separate it like a pie. In the Greek, it'll tell you that's what that means. It's by rightly dividing the word of truth that all scripture is profitable. So only by rightly dividing it can it be profitable. Now it doesn't contradict. Now it doesn't contradict. And I can help somebody with that contradiction today. I mean, it means to cut straight. So we, it's a verse that tells you to study, too. Right? And it tells you to study. And why? To be approved unto God. Like, like um, Matt would say, you could either be approved or disapproved. You could be ashamed or unashamed. It's up, totally up to you. I've been trying to get this through to people in the denominations. That they, they just don't. Well, our pastor gives us the verse, their pride and know nothing. I hate to say that, but that's the verse Paul uses. I mean, now, now I'll share this and then, you know, I don't, I don't know how long I've gone. About an hour almost. Okay. I don't know if you've heard this one, but. Adam lived under two dispensations. He had to rightly divide the word of God. He literally did. 
His first dispensation was uh, dress and keep the garden, innocence, name all the animals, and be not ashamed. That was it. And he's living in the grace of God, in the garden. Freely eat. That's grace. Freely. We saw that in Romans 3. This gift is freely given. He told Adam, freely eat, right? That he was under grace. But he gave him a command, and we know he disobeyed and threw us all into sin, all humanity. And that's when the shame shows up, right? Because he was ashamed. And God it, had to it, find him, right? He was covering his nakedness. His whole condition changed mm -hmm. instantaneously. I tell people, I go to juvenile hall today, and I always tell them, what's the guilty man's first defense? Point the finger to blame somebody else. Mm -hmm. And you can find it in Genesis 3, Adam, when he was questioned. You, God, and that woman, you gave. Immediately, no accountability, right. dishonesty, inconsiderate. It's, it's our sinful nature, selfishness. Wow. And it, so that was his first dispensation. And then, of course, we know he ate of the tree and he died. There's three deaths in Scripture. And he died spiritually, separated from God. So today, God just looks at us either you're in, in Adam or you're in Christ. There's no Jew or Gentile. There's no. He made nations, tongues, and uh, languages for his purpose, but we're all one race. We're just a human race. And he only looks at us as saved or lost in Adam or in Christ. That's it. There's no respect. Or, and, and Adam threw it all away right here. We see that, right? That was his first stewardship to Tent, dress and keep, name all the animals. You'll find that in Genesis 2, 15 and 19. And not be ashamed. That was the first. Of course, he listens to what is right inside Satan's policy of evil. He listens to the lie program. Mm -hmm. And here, he's kicked out of the garden. And now he's given a new set of instruction. And every time man's condition changes... Because the, the circumstance, God changes a dispensation. Changes the marching orders, he, right? He changes the stewardship. Mm -hmm. New economy, new stewardship, new, rules. new dispensation, new rules. Now, I had to learn that it's all scriptural. It's like I was going to James, talking about pouring oil on these people in the hospital. Prayer of the sick, we heal, the, it's prayer of faith. What? I should do it all my heart, and they die. It's all scriptural. It's all true, but it don't all apply. I, so we can't just be scriptural. We have to be dispensational. That's what I was. So it was a process, but now I, I know I understand. I'm a defender of this now. I defended this in a meeting of AA the other day. They got this thing. They say, uh. My grandmother's God, or that punishing God, that's not my God no more, and they make their own up. It's usually nature, the wind, the sun, the water. The deep. My God rides a Harley, and we go fishing on Sunday and all this mess. And I'm like, I straightened it out. I said, look, you're a, we live in grace. God's not accounting your sin when you put your faith in Christ. You are forgiven. You're justified by the blood he shed. And they're like, I'm going, that's deep for them. I mean, you know that's baby step, but they're like, this dude's talking, he's religious, but I'm not religious. It's relationship, we know that. And one guy stood up and said, the law applies, the law. He's a religious guy. He'd been going to church way longer than me. So I had to quote uh, Ephesians 2 and 8, Romans 5 and 1. And I had the chair that day, so I had the last word, by the way. And he, and, and he tried to straighten me out in the parking lot. He said, you go home and break the commandments. I said, I, I don't want to. I, I, I walk in love. I, I want to fulfill them all through the Spirit of God. But I can. I told him, I can. It's part it, of suffering, right? Yeah, it affects my reward. He said, they don't understand all that. They don't. 
So you can't argue with these people. He went mad. He went away mad, made a scene, and left mad. I just stood there like. Hopefully he'll be a Berean and search it out. It's interesting you get the two extremes, right? You get the guy that's the Harley and the fishing god, and then you get the guy that's the super religious guy, right? Exactly what them rooms are like. You need to take them right in the middle of that. And bring them to the grace of God yeah. by faith alone. That's the second step. Came to believe. I'm trying to tell them. Now, I'll end here because we want Satan's first, I mean Satan, Adam's first dispensation was Dress and keep, name all the animals, be not ashamed. Don't be ashamed, Adam. His, his second dispensation, when sin entered, by the way, because the word was contradicted, added, and subtracted, we know he, right? Watered down. We don't do that. That's the new translations. Man's condition changed, so therefore God's stewardship to man changed, Right? And God sent them out the garden, which he had put them in, Genesis 3.23. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden. Tough love, that's what we call it today. Their naked is, nakedness is now covered. Unto Adam, also his wife, did the Lord make coats of skins. And we know that points to the cross. They were literally redeemed right here. That was a spiritual thing. You got to teach that too. They don't. They think they just put a line cloth on there. No, that's spiritual. God's talking. The righteousness of God was imputed onto these people. They were no longer to be ashamed in their nakedness. Unashamed, I mean. See, so he clo he covers them with his righteousness, and now you no longer to be unashamed. They were no longer to be unashamed in their nakedness. That's what it says, huh? He clothed them. They were no longer. In their first stewardship, they were promised life. Adam and Eve, no, not death while in the garden in their innocence. They would now experience death. God judged their sin. Physical death, spiritual death. Eventually the second death, Revelation 20. God said, you'll surely die. So Adam's second stewardship and we, we see in, in the, well, we know that he can't go back in the garden, that he's going to till the ground <clears throat> from the brow of his face. The ground's not going to give up her fruit any longer. So now he has to work and stay out of the garden. That's two stewardships. Adam lived in two dispensations. So when Adam looked at the garden, he couldn't go back in there and say, well, it's scriptural because he knew he'd be disobeying the word of God. He knew that his new stewardship was to stay out of the garden and till the ground and give sacrifice. He taught Abel. So we know that he was, at, it's Moedim in, in the Hebrew, a, a scheduled time they came to meet God with their blood sacrifice. So he had a totally new set of stewardship. And that's, that's how we are today. We have to rightly divide the word of truth. That's the way we have to be like Adam and rightly divide. We can't go back to Adam's first dispensation. We can't go back to the law. We have to stay in but now. I like how Pastor Ron, he says that the Bible's written like a life, past, present, and future. We have to stay in the present today. And that's Paul. That's Paul. That's the Pauline dispensation. And then we'll end here. I know I said that, but I'll end right here. There's two divisions in Scripture that we have to rightly divide. And if you ask anyone in denominations, they'll say, New Testament, Old Testament. That's what they say. And you go, wrong. They're like, you know. They don't know what they don't know. What the, so you tell them it's prophecy and mystery. Prophecy is that which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Acts 3.21 Prophecy is concerned with the earth and Christ reign upon it with God's earthly people, Israel. Mystery, Romans 16.25, 
that which was kept secret since the world began. Now, if you don't see that, and it has to do with the church, the body of Christ, mystery is concerned with heaven and our exaltation. I, it says here with Christ, but I've learned now he's presenting us to God the Father. So they erred there, and Christ will reign on earth with Israel. But I didn't know that. He's going to present the body of Christ to the Father. Imagine that. Prophecy was prophesied, it was spoken. Mystery was kept secret and was unprophesied. But now. But now. But now. And like Pastor Ron teaches us all the time, go back to Genesis 1.1. God starts the Bible at first mention. He works in two spheres. He always had heaven and earth. And he teaches on his little diagram how God worked on the earth until Paul. So that's my story, how I got to where I am today. And then when that pastor told me to leave, I went to another church I attended. And this pastor literally, because me and my wife were under him like seven years, he literally said, do you want to get ordained? Because I went through his college before and all that. I was like, I didn't know how to answer that, but I said, well, the first thing you got to know is I'm not paying no tithing. I'm going to give as God purposes my heart. God, God likes a cheerful giver, not uh, one. How does that, how's that verse go, Ryan? 1 Corinthians 6. I knew what Ryan back there helped me there. Not grudgingly, not of necessity. But 2 Corinthians 9, nine, 7, every man according as he purposed in his heart, That's so right. let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. That's the first thing I told him. I'm going to give as God gives to me. And he's like, thought about it. You know, okay. His wife runs over there. What's going on? He goes, well, he's just going to give a little different. Just calm down. You know. And I told him, I'll explain that to you one day. I didn't want to tell him like tithing does not apply to it. And that's where we ended. Eventually, we left that ministry because to Timothy. I'll show you why I left. I was reading the Word of God. I showed him this information. He came to me and said, "We could agree to disagree, but if I changed the way we taught, I'd have to go back over 20 years, and even the men I sent, I would have to relearn them." I said, yeah, that's right. And he told me to agree to disagree. And my brother Ryan back there told me one day, he said, is Christ divided? Yeah, does the mind of Christ agree to disagree with itself? We're all supposed to have the mind of Christ. That's one mind, right? That's right. We're, we're, till we, we're built up to that faith, that mind. One God, one faith, one baptism. Show them that verse when they're doing some water. One baptism. See, that they don't... I'm telling you, uh, we, were, we were rejected, isolated, silenced, and ignored eventually in this ministry. And I had an ordination. They gave me this, the ministry. I married my son, by the way. I was able to marry my son uh, and my nephew with that ordination. But when I decided to walk away, he told me, if you do, you've got to give your ordination back. And I said, oh, you're going to take your ball back because I don't want to play? <laughs> he said, yeah. he's, cause he said, because that's what he would tell everybody when he counseled them. Oh, you're going to take your ball back because they don't want to play like you do. I told him the same thing. He didn't like it. but. <laughs> and these are the verses right here where I was sitting alone one day when he told me to agree to disagree. I was like, I can't. I can't do that, Lord. I'm just, I can't do it. And I went to 2 Timothy 1 through 3. I'll go, uh, chapter one, or? one Timothy, I'm sorry, one Timothy chapter two, one through three, I'll read, uh, chapter two, one Timothy, did I say, one Timothy two, one through three, no, that's the prayer where they shut me down, okay, that's that one, I was cut off, I'm sorry, go to one Timothy one and three. And Paul says, 
I'll start at four. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry, three. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou might charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Mm -hmm. That hit me hard. Agree to disagree doesn't work too well with that verse. It does not. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. This verse. Now, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience, and this one got me, and of faith unfeigned. That's genuine. Genuine faith. You can't... You, you, we're not to compromise. We're not to partake in this water baptism. We're not to give tithings. We're not to... I mean, I could go on and on, but those are the main ones. And the tongue thing, but... We're not to do these things just to keep my ordination. I could have kept it. I still have it on my wall. It's canceled out now, but he, he, won't, he said, if you leave, I'm taking that back. And I didn't think about it. I went, okay. I was ready. Man's doctrine. And that one got me, and 2 Timothy 2 and 7 got me. Now we're winding down. 2 Timothy 2 and 7. And Paul says, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. I went, wow. The Lord give thee understanding. In all things. And Paul personalizes it, right? Consider what I say, I follow. And he also says, follow me as I follow Christ. I mean, you start putting these things together and you realize this doctrine is specifically for the body of Christ. Period. And it ends with us. And it's for our sanctification and reward. It's not just something that... It, it is serious stuff. And then there's another one, 2 Timothy 3 and 10. It says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine. This is when I, I went to him and said, I'm leaving. I, this, is, this is when I went, huh? Manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Paul's our pattern. He's our ensample, he says. He, he laid the foundation. He's the master builder. You, once you learn this, you can't reject him. You have to follow him to your reward. There's just no way I could ever go back and sit under that teaching. That well, I wasn't growing. I come here and I grow daily. I grow. Everything he teaches, I write, I write it, I study it, I preach it out on the internet. Everything he's, I'm learning here. I just, you know, kind of my own way, but I mean, so this is, this is what got me. Unfeigned faith. I couldn't pretend no more that to be your minister. And do things how you're doing it here. I don't even mean bring up two Timothy or is it one chapter two? Women learn in silence. Don't answer. I'm not even bring that one up. But that's another one. So that's my journey, and that's where I am today because of the grace of God. Give him all the credit. And by the way, just for testimony's sake, I've been declared free. Uh, cured of hepatitis 3, C, this month. I, I was on third stage because my disease, and it took me so long to clear my mind. By the time I got checked and, uh, you know, insured and all that, I was on one more stage. I didn't need a liver. I wouldn't need a liver. And uh, God saved me once again, once again, you know, stayed. And so now I have opportunity where my liver will literally Remanufactured strength in it, hopefully. But and it, it's a lot of peace of mind not knowing that your times are coming real soon. You know what I mean? But um, so I I hope y'all enjoyed that. I didn't mean to take hostage of y'all for so long, but uh, 
Let's pray. Bless the word. Lord, thank you for this opportunity. It's an honor. Bless our pastor that he get well and, and his baby girl, his family. Bless NorCal Grace, Lord. May the joy of the Lord be our strength, and may the peace of God rule our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs> That's awesome.